Hello, I'm going to uh, briefly go over a huge canon of children's literature, Black and African American literature. And I'm going to be showing some offensive um, examples of early uh, literature reflecting stereotypes and just not great representation of uh, African and Black uh, citizens. And I feel like it's necessary for me to do this in that there's a better ability to understand the immense importance of Black African American children's literature, what they did. They have set the standard in terms of how to move through some of the oppression and inability to get their positive reflections in children's books and how they went about it. And this is sounding all confusing, but again, I just feel it's important to say that at the beginning of this and to also say that I am a white individual curating this lecture, which means that it's coming from my standpoint. So there you have it. Here we go. So African-Americans have been depicted in general literature since way back, 17th century, right? Unfortunately, the, that reflection and depiction representation has been riddled with, with stereotypes, pejorative, which means bad, ugly, awful, and unauthentic reflections of Black and African-American culture. Um, uh, there was lots of examples. I'm going to go through a couple of them here where popular books, popular in, in the dominant culture libraries and houses, popular books really portraying um, Black and African-American uh, citizens in really crappy ways, just in a nutshell. This was a popular uh, series, Nicodemus. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to even read some of the reviews. It's just like everyone was, was delighted with this. Well, was everyone delighted with this? No, the dominant culture accessing these books and also everybody else. Some people were not so delighted with, with the, the way that their culture was reflected. Like, okay, just as a counter around that time, another uh, popular series was The Boxcar Children. And this was a popular series reflecting the dominant culture and reflecting it in a very different way. Meanwhile, we have books reflecting Black and African American citizens in a really different way. So here's a book from 1929, Liza Jane and the Kinkies. Here's another book from 1929, A Story of Curly Locks. So again, what have we done? We have, oh gee, it's just, okay, let me just read the quote. It's not until the early part of the 20th century that non-mainstream works for children begin to appear as a reaction to all the ugliness, to all the stereotyping and gross misrepresentations and awful stories that were written from a white perspective. And that's what we need to look at here is that that books of other cultures, and we're going to talk about a lot in this course, they're written from a white perspective, which is not an authentic perspective. And sometimes it's more than not authentic. It's just wretched and ugly. And for just so you know, the, the story of Little Black Sambo First published in 1899, as I kind of said in the uh, review um, of literature, it's still out there. Children are still reading it. Written by a white woman. Perpetuating wretched stereotypes. Serving the white dominant culture, right? So an incredible author and, oh my gosh, this fabulous illustrator, there's tons of books by both of them, um, decided to do something about Little Black Sambo in the, I can't remember when he wrote this. I'm not sure. So he um, really updated 
and really made this a robust tale because it's an interesting story. Julius Lester. So he said, when I read Little Black Sambo as a child, I had no choice but to identify with him because I am black. And so was he. Even as I sit here now and write, the feelings of shame and embarrassment and hurt come back. And there was a bit of confusion because I liked the story. I especially liked those pancakes. But the illustrations exaggerated the racial features. Society had made it clear to me, representing my racial inf inf inferiority. Hmm. The black, black skin, the eyes shining white, the red protruding lips. I did not feel good about myself as a black child looking at these pictures. And it, I'm, that's a theme we're going to repeat in all of different cultures. I did not feel good about children's books that I looked at that were supposedly reflecting me. So he explains that for black children, I must address myself to blacks to write books that will hopefully give black children the strength and pride that have been deliberately kept from them. It will be a long time before the massive whites look upon black children as blacks and as individuals. I do not exist in this country as an individual. I am black. So that complicated kind of uh, stuff there, right? But just the idea that he continues, Julius Lester, who's written amazing books, continues to champion the cause of, show, of showing, reflecting, representing, presenting uh, black and African-American children as full-bodied, like, incredible beings in incredible books. So he is not the only one who did that. And that's the amazing thing. Way back when all these awful, wretched stereotypes were, were being created, there were a number of uh, black and African-American academics that pushed back on that whole thing. And W.E.B. Du Bois was an important um, activist way back, way back, way back. And he did something incredible. He uh, helped to initiate in 1920 um, these, uh, the Brownies, their book. And it was this publication. It was this really cool magazine that, um, that reflected all sorts of stuff, some intellectual thought by uh, black academics, but it was all for black and African-American children. Right. And it was say like they would get these these cute, wonderful magazines and it was about them. It was like important things and robust things. So it, it was really fabulous. It unfortunately didn't make it right. Didn't make it. There was not enough popularity, you know, because who it was. It could have been so wonderful for everybody. Right. But everybody wasn't buying it. Another um, academic uh, Woodson, he just wanted to be sure that that there was a solid body of work put forth for to wipe out all those awful books and to bring into um, libraries and schools and stuff books written by Black and African American authors and illustrators and about Black and Amer Black and African Americans. Right, so big stuff, big stuff, and. Um, uh, Augusta Baker just really making sure that that um, black children were getting the books they needed in, in libraries. Well, they were few and far be between back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, but th that didn't mean that the work wasn't being done. And that was really such an important part of black and African-American children's uh, literature. So exciting if you look at the whole trajectory of where this, this literature has gone. It's like just amazing. So this is a fabulous quote, and it's really, it's probably, it's indicative of all, a lot of oppressed uh, cultures in our society, right? There's, there's so many of them, and we talk about a number of them, uh, but because literature reflects the struggles, experiences, and aspiration of its creators, so not necessarily from the white perspective, right? It is not surprising that African-American children's literature has developed distinct characteristics, and has focused to a large extent on affirming African-American life, culture, and history, right? So they're going to like wipe out that whole pile of awful books by making sure that Black and African-American history is, is portrayed in really exciting, interesting, positive ways, important ways, right? They're going to do that because, because of the oppression has, has been so bad that they're going to just go way over to the other side and talk about important things, really important things, right? 
really important things. I mean, this is the story of Rosa Parks. I mean, I didn't get her in my history books when I was growing up. And if you grew up in, in uh, the U.S., hopefully, because you're a lot younger, you're getting some of it. Rosa Parks like literally started the Civil Rights Movement by refusing to get off the bus, right? So that's another thing, history point that everybody should know about, the importance of desegregating bu buses, m making um, uh, people of color stand up when a white person came on the bus and, and vacate their seat if there wasn't one for the, for the white person. Big stuff. And children's books can do that in a developmentally appropriate way. So that is just so important. Ah, I love this stuff. So to counter... The, the oppression and the stereotypes, this literature, this canon of literature has so done it. So done it. Because it's so important that, that and as we're learning more and more now, right, that we know that Black and African Americans all share the experience of being members of a society in which race matters more than it should. And y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm not even going to deconstruct that. So what do they do? They counter the dominant culture by just by saying yeah there's not just an anglo white ideal of beauty we're going to show you beautiful they counter some of the oppression the, the 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 idea of slavery the idea of fighting for equality for for racial uplift for voters rights for all the stuff that's been happening so long so Story of Ruby Bridges, the story of Ruby Bridges. So we're going to talk about desegregating schools. We're going to talk about the first kid that was sent into an all-white school at six years old, this brave, brave Ruby Bridges, and had to have um, marshals guarding her because of what was out there. Well, who was out there screaming, you know, go home, get out of here. A six-year-old, brave hero right? Immortalized by a pretty famous uh, American artist, Norman Rockwell. Important stuff. And there's Ruby Bridges with uh, President Obama looking at that photo. Excuse me, that painting. Oh, I want to see that painting. So important stuff. In information about the institution of sl slavery. This is a great, great book. Look at it. It's in the link. It's true story too. Important stuff. Struggles for equality and racial uplift. So the cool thing that happened, Langston Hughes, and he was a very popular um, adult writer and, and poet and, and had crossed over, you know, the, the boundaries of just only that he wasn't only for black you know, citizens, he, everybody loved him. So what does he do? He starts writing children's books. And so did other intellects because they wanted stuff to be published. Published. People weren't publishing. The big publishing houses weren't publishing children's books of color. They weren't doing it. And that was before you could like, you know, that was just big presses and big uh, racist, you know, white privileged publishers not picking these books. So what happened is that that already published black writers were coming down and not coming down, but go, going across and working to get children's books, black children's books published. In fact, the African-American um, publishing houses, they were the very first ones that were independent and small and got some books published and bypassed some of those bigger ones. Easier to do now, right? But it wasn't then. So the idea of presenting non-white dominant ideas of beauty and power and importance. Big stuff. And so important, effects of the dominant beauty standards, right? Countering what is considered ideal beauty. And we'll talk about that more. Big one. It's such a big one. Like what is what is deemed beautiful? And if, if the standard is it's the white ideal everybody else fails right and and so children's books reflecting this so important and there's a million well that's an exaggeration but there are easily 30 to 40 to 50 books talking about black hair in children's books and you're thinking is that overkill no look at some of the history of of this there's just 
uh, you could do a whole thesis on on why uh, the, uh, the importance of, of black hair and why it has been just put into this space that is so so piteous because it doesn't um, it doesn't live up to the what is considered the ideal standard. There's a whole history of it. It's 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 an amazing and fascinating, and it's not an ancient history. It's not an ancient history. W- women and girls are still being slammed for wearing their hair naturally in uh, non-dominant cultures, right? And specifically in Black and African American cultures, big stuff. So, what do we want? What do we want to do? We want to reflect all of our people in in our culture. Sorry, when I look at this picture, I just want to cry. So, the, the importance of seeing yourself in your society, of seeing something so powerful and so positive in your culture, in your world, and everyone else seeing that too. It's it's amazingly huge. So yeah, we're going to still keep talking about it. We're going to still keep debunking the idea of what is beautiful and what is right. This is a lovely Sesame Street uh, little short video. You got to watch it. It just will bring a big smile to your face and important stuff, important stuff to counter the dominant ideal, right? And and Black and African-American children's books that are authentically written by the culture do that so well. And they got to do it, right? They got to keep doing it because of the racism that is just continuing to erupt specifically, specifically, for Black and African Americans, right? So we're going to uplift all of this. We're going to be talking about it in children's books. And you're kind of getting the idea of the importance of it to counter some of the negative stereotypes that I started this lecture with. Ugh. Another amazing thing that the uh, canon of Black and African American children's literature has done is to talk about the amazing contributions of African Americans. And sure, we want to talk about uh, Martin Luther King. We want to talk about him because he was amazing. But we got to have other stories, right? There wasn't just one person that was amazing. And these children's books really are talking about Sojourner Truth that talked about Ain't I a Woman Too? The fabulous person pushing and uplifting the Black and African American culture and things that we just haven't learned we've learned about not that long ago right if you saw this movie it's based on a book it's based on stories about that these that black women sent white men to the moon read about it so repeating this quote again all the stuff, themes such as the effects of racism, information about the institution of slavery, struggles for equality and racial uplift, effects of dominant beauty standards, questions of identity and contributions of Amer- African Americans are ama- are common <laughs> across African American children's literature. So see, all those themes, got to apply them to every other culture that we're looking at and sociocultural that we're looking at in this this class. I should do that. I never thought I need to do that put that that's a great standard right right there that's a great schematic for for improving all people of color children's books so here's my question how can we help counter sexist and racist messages you know what i'm gonna say change the message let's reflect everybody in our society and reflect it not from the white perspective right nope This is a fabulous um, poem. So it's linked. Give it a holla. Give it a look. Because again, it reflects how far, oh, or how not far we've come when we look at different cultures, specifically Black and African American cultures in our society. Children's books are happening. And they're getting better. Get one. Read some. Read them to any kid and any adult. There's some beautiful stuff out there, but we've got a long ways to go, right? Oof. Thanks. Talk to you soon.